Hello grade 12, so this lesson is on DNA, the code of life, and it's for revision for your life science paper 2 tomorrow. Okay, this is just the department's guidelines. Okay, so an introduction, we have the structure of the nucleus. So this is now a nucleus. Here we see the nucleopore and the nucleoplasm with free floating nucleotides. And then there's chromatin network, which unwinds to form chromosomes during interphase of cell division. Then we get the nucleolus, which, conti which contains ribosomal RNA. We have the nuclear membrane, and it is a double membrane, which is continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. And that is the blue part here. And on the endoplasmic reticulum is these little red things, which are called ribosomes. Then we get two kinds of nucleic acids. We get DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA, ribonucleic acid. And DNA and RNA are made up of nucleotides, and nucleotides are monomers. And monomers are building blocks. So if they ask you what are the monomers of nucleic acids, you say they are nucleotides. And each nucleic acid is made up of a phosphate portion, a sugar portion, which is this pentagon here, and then a nitrogenous base. So this whole thing here collectively is called a nucleotide and then in RNA you also get the phosphate portion, the little pentagon sugar portion and then the nitrogenous base. And in DNA the sugar is deoxyribose sugar and in RNA it's ribose sugar. Then we have the thymine there and the uracil there for DNA and RNA. Then DNA. The location of DNA we find it in the nucleus in mitochondria and then in chloroplasts in plants. The structure of DNA, it's made up of four nitrogenous bases and they are split into purines and pyrimidines. Adenine and thymine form complementary base pairs, that's why they are on the same orangey red color. And guanine and cytosine are complementary base pairs and that's why they are in the same color. The above are complementary base pairs held together by weak hydrogen bonds. The sugar molecule of one nucleotide pairs to the phosphate ion of another by sugar phosphate bonds. So the bonds between complementary base pairs are weak hydrogen bonds and the bonds between sugar molecules and the phosphate ion of another molecule are sugar phosphate bonds. And this forms the ladder-like DNA molecule which twists so that one strand coils around the other to form a double helix. The functions of DNA is to control protein synthesis and transmit hereditary character characteristics from parents to offspring. And then we get genes and non-coding DNA. A gene is a small portion of DNA which carries the genetic code for the formation of a particular characteristic and that codes for proteins. Whereas non-coding DNA is basically the opposite of a gene because it does not code for anything. So it does not code for a specific amino acid. Then we get the history of DNA. We have four people, Rosalind Franklin, Maurice Wilkins, James Watson, and Francis Crick. Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins work together, and James Watson and Francis Crick work together. And Rosalind Frank Franklin saw that DNA was a double helix structure because she took x-ray diffraction pictures and she died from cancer in 1958. But Maurice Wilkins, who was a partner in, the, in their studies, didn't like her, so he basically stole the x-ray pictures and showed them to James Watson. And James Watson and Francis, Francis Crick were also doing studies on DNA, and they saw that there are similar amounts of cytosine and guanine, and adenine and thymine. So they call them complementary base pairs because they figured that these two must join together if they have similar amounts and then adenine and thymine must join together if they have similar amounts. So they saw that complementary base pairs function in the replication of DNA. And because of the pictures that they got from Maurice Wilkins, they were able to make a model of DNA in 1953, which had a double helix structure. And the three of them won the Nobel Prize for their model because at that point Rosalind Franklin had died. So they basically stole her work to, to come up with their model while Maurice Wilkins did. 
Okay, and then we get RNA, which is ribonucleic acid. And there are three places we find RNA. We find messenger RNA, which is in the nucleus, and then it um, flows out of the nuclear, the nuclear pores in the nuclear membrane into the cytoplasm, where there is transfer RNA. And then there's also ribosomal RNA in the cytoplasm of a cell. Then we get the structure of RNA. It is single-stranded. It is not coiled. The sugar used is ribose sugar. Thiamine is replaced by uracil, but the other three nitrogenous bases are still there, which is cytosine, guanine, and adenine. So it's just the thiamine that is replaced by uracil. And then the chains are shorter than in DNA. Functions of RNA, all three types of RNA play a role in protein synthesis. Then we get DNA profiling. What is a DNA profile? It is a pattern of black bars on x-ray film when an x-ray of DNA is put through a chemical process. That rest of the sentence is not there. And it is a method of identifying an individual by comparing their DNA fingerprint with already known DNA fingerprints. So the word fingerprint is really just like a an analogy to a human finger like your thumb fingerprints because we know that our thumb fingerprints are individual to everyone. So everyone has their own individual unique fingerprint. So they basically use that analogy saying that everyone's DNA profile, they, the black bars that come out from someone's DNA is identical to each person. So it's just an analogy. It's not actually a fingerprint, okay? Then uses of DNA profiling is to investigate crimes, to identify organisms from their remains, to identify family relationships and not other than and paternity, to test for the presence of specific alleles and to establish matching tissues for organ transplants. And if we look here, so they could give you a question like this where you have to identify who is the suspect and why. So here's the DNA that was found at the crime scene and this is the victim's DNA. So we know that the other DNA is now not the victim's DNA because they say you find a hair in the person person's house and you do a DNA profile and then you find that it's actually the victim's hair so then that's not useful in finding the suspect but yeah you can compare the crime scene the DNA found at the crime scene to the suspect's DNA so you have your first suspect and your second suspect and you see that it's not similar to the victim so it must be the persecutor and then you see that it's actually similar to Suspect 1, it's basically, it is exactly the same. So then you know that suspect 1 is probably the person who committed the crime. If you have to explain why, then you say because the DNA profiles are identical. Then a comparison of DNA and RNA. So similarities, sugar alternating with phosphate portions. So it's basically just the nucleotides. There's a sugar, then it's connected to a phosphate, and that phosphate is connected to the next sugar. Um... And then both have adenine, guanine, and cytosine, and both have a function in protein synthesis. Then the differences of DNA and RNA. DNA is found in the nucleus and mitochondria, whereas RNA is found in the nucleus, ribosomes, and, and the cytoplasm. Then DNA is a long molecule and RNA is a short molecule. DNA is double-stranded, whereas RNA is single-stranded. DNA has deoxyribose sugar, whereas RNA has ribose sugar. And then DNA has the nitrogenous base thiamine, and that is replaced by uracil in RNA. Then we get to DNA replication. We need to know when it takes place, and it takes place in interphase of mitosis. We need to know where it takes place, and it takes place in the nucleoplasm of the nucleus. Why does it take place? For chromosomes to have identical information, so mitosis can take place, and it equalizes the reduction division. So it first doubles up before it divides. Otherwise, if you just start dividing immediately, you're going to have half the amount of chromosomes and we don't want that in mitosis. Okay, and then we get to how. So you must memorize this. Uh, it's like likely to be asked and is very easy mark. So in the nucleus, the DNA double helix unwinds. The DNA then unzips, so it first unwinds and then it unzips, okay, to expose the nitrogenous bases. Each original strand serves as a template for free-floating nucleotides which are in the nucleoplasm and they come attached here to these. So they attach using complementary base pairs 
Therefore, genetically identical DNA molecules are formed, each consisting of one original and one new strand. And enzymes control the process. So it unwinds, then it unzips, the hydrogen bronze break, exposing the nitrogenous bases. Free-floating nucleotides in the nucleoplasm come join along here using complementary base pairs. Genetically identical DNA molecules are formed, each consisting of one original and one new strand, and enzymes control the process. Then we get to protein synthesis. It's made up of two, um, two processes. The first one is transcription, and the next one is translation. I always think of C comes before L, transcript translate so c become comes before l so that's how you know transcription is first the double helix dna unwind so this part is basically the same as the beginning of dna replication so the double helix dna unwinds the double stranded dna unzips because weak hydrogen bonds break to form two separate strands one strand only one now in dna replication it's two but yeah only one strand is used as a template to form mrna using free rna nucleotides from the nucleoplasm why because now uracil must come here and attach to the adenine the mrna is complementary to the dna mrna now has the coded message for protein synthesis then the mrna leaves the nucleus via the um, nucleo, the nuclear pore in the nuclear membrane. And then we get to translation. mRNA moves from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and attaches to the ribosome. So yeah, you can see the ribosome. Each transfer RNA carries a specific amino acid. So each tRNA has a specific amino acid that they carry. It's like their specialized amino acid. So only that's um, tRNA carries that kind of amino acid. It won't carry a different amino acid. When the anticodon, so yeah, you can see three um, nitrogenous bases on a mRNA strand is called a codon. This will also be a codon, and this will also be a codon. And tRNA carries the anticodon. So this UAC will be the anticodon to this codon here that's on the mRNA. So when the anticodon on the tRNA matches the codon on the mRNA, the tRNA will bring that required amino acid to the ribosome and attach it to the amino acid, I mean, sorry, to the mRNA. And then the amino acids, which are formed here at the top, are then attached to each other by peptide bonds to form the required protein. So this red um, line there is called a peptide bond and it attaches the amino acids to each other and that's why a different name for a protein is a polypeptide bond poly meaning many peptides bonds so it means that there are many peptide bonds which are connecting the amino acids and amino acids are the monomers of proteins what are monomers they are the building blocks so Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, and they are joined by peptide bonds to form the required protein that the mRNA has coded for. Okay, and then that's everything to DNA replication.